Dante's Inferno, Canto 32. Had I but rhymes, rugged and harsh and hoarse, fit for the hideous hole on which the weight of all those rocks grinds downward course by course, I might press out my matter's juice complete. As tis, I tremble lest the telling mar the tale. For truly, to describe the great fundament of the world is very far from being a task for idle wits at play or infant tongues that pipe mama, papa. But may those heavenly ladies aid my lay that helped Amphion's wall-high Thebes with stone, lest from the truth my wandering verses stray. Oh, well for you, dregs of damnation, thrown in that last sink which words are weak to tell, had you lived as sheep or goats in the world of the sun. When we were down in the deep of the darkling well, under the feet of the giant, and yet more low, and I still gazed up, but the towering walls of hell. I heard it said, Take heed how thou dost go, for fear thy feet should tremble as they pass on the heads of the weary brotherhood of woe. I turned and saw, stretched out before my face and neath my feet, a lake so bound with ice it did not look like water, but like glass. Danube in Austria never could disguise his wintry course beneath a shroud so thick as this, nor Tanais under frozen skies afar. If Pietropan or Tanbernic had crashed full weight on it, the very rim would not have given so much as even a creek. And as with muscles peeping from the stream, the frogs sit croaking in the time of year when gleaning haunts the peasant woman's dream. So, wedged in ice to the point at which appear the hues of shame, livid and with their teeth chattering like stalks, the dismal shades stood there. Their heads were bowed towards the ice beneath. Their eyes attest their grief. Their mouths proclaim the bitter airs that through that dungeon breathe. My gaze roamed round a while, and when it came back to my feet, found two shades so close pressed, their hair was mingled on the heads of them. I said, you two, thus cramponed breast to breast, tell me who you are. They heaved their necks a strain to see me, and as they stood with faces raised, their eyes, which were but inly wet till then, gushed at the lids. At once the fierce frost blocked the tears between them and sealed them shut again. Never was wood to wood, so rigid, locked by clamps of iron. Like butting goats, they jarred their heads together, by helpless fury rocked. Then one, who'd lost both ears from off his scarred head with the cold, still keeping his face down, cried out, Why dost thou stare at us so hard? Wouldst learn who those two are? Then be it known, they and their father Albert held the valley from which the waters of Bicentio run. None of them issued from one mother's belly, nor shalt thou find such old Caina through two shades more fit 
to stand here fixed in jelly? Not him whose breast and shadow at one blow was pierced together by the sword of Arthur. Not for Catria, nor this other who so blocks me with his head I can see no father called Sassel Mascaroni. If thou be Tuscan, thou knowest him, and I'll tell thee rather than thou shouldst plague me for more speech with thee. I'm Camithion del Pazzi, and I wait till Carlin come to make excuse for me. Then I saw a thousand faces, and thousands yet made doggish with the cold, so that for dread I shudder and always shall whenever I set eyes on a frozen pool. And as we made towards the centre, where all waits down way, and I was shivering in the eternal shade, whether it was will, fate, chance, I cannot say, but threading through the heads, I struck my heel hard on a face that stood athwart my way. Why trample me? What for? It clamoured shrill. Art come to make the vengeance I endure from Monteperti more vindictive still? Master, I cried, wait, wait for me, I abjure. Wait, please, then hurry me on as thou shalt choose, but I think I know who it is, and I must make sure. The master stopped, and while the shade let loose volleys of oaths, who art thou cursing so? and treating people to such foul abuse, said I. And he, nay, who art thou to go through Antonora kicking people's faces? Thou mightst be living, it was so shrewd a blow. Living I am, said I. Do thou sing praises for that? If thou seek fame, I'll give thee it, writing thy name with other notable cases. All I demand is just the opposite. Be off and pester me no more, he said. To try such wheedling here shows little wit. At that, I grasped the scruff behind his neck. Thou'lt either tell me thy name or have thy hair stripped from thy scalp. I panted, shred by shred, pluck it all out, he said. I'll not declare my name, nor show my face, though thou insist and break my head a thousand times, I swear. I'd got his hair twined tightly in my fist already, and wrenched away a tuft or two. He, yelping, head down, stubborn to resist, when another called out, Hey, Bocca, what's to do? Don't thy jaws make enough infernal clatter? But what the devil must thou start barking to? There, that's enough, said I. Thou filthy traitor, thou needst not speak. But to thy shame I'll see the whole world hears true tidings of this matter. And when we'd left him in that icy bed, I saw two frozen together in one hole so that the one head capped the other head. And as starved men tear bread, this tore the pole of the one beneath, chewing with ravenous jaw, where the brain meets marrow, just beneath the skull. With no more furious zest did Tidius gnaw the scalp of Menelippus than he ate at the brain pan and other tissues roar. Oh, thou that in such bestial wise do sate thy rage on him thou munchest, tell me why. On this condition, I said, that if they hate seems justified, I undertake that I, knowing who you are, and knowing all his crime, will see thee righted in the world on high, unless my tongue wither before the time. 